uh, for the program Writing the Western Landscape, featuring Reno poets Anne Kennison, Gilmarie Palmeyer, and Sean Griffin. It's such a pleasure to have the three of you here this evening during National Poetry Month, no less. If you haven't already visited Sagebrush and Solitude, Maynard Dixon in Nevada, I encourage you to do so after this evening's talk. The exhibition is located on the third floor in the John Hawley's Olds Legata Gallery and the Robert Z. Hawkins Gallery and will be on view until July 28th. Uh, thank you to our generous sponsors for making this exhibition a possibility and thank you to all of you and our members for being here this evening. I'd like to introduce Anne Keniston who contributed an essay about D Dixon's poetry in the exhibition's ac accompanying book, which you can purchase in the museum shop. Dr. Ann Kennison is a Nevada-based poet, essayist, literary critic, and professor of English at the University of Nevada, Reno, with a particular interest in the relation of the creative to the scholarly. She is the author of several poetry collections, including most recently Somatic in 2020, as well as numerous scholarly studies of contemporary American poetry. She has published poems in journals including the Yale Review, the Gettysburg Review, and Literary Imagination, and is currently at work on a volume of personal scholarly essays and a collection of poems focusing on the visual arts, art forgery, and the art market. Welcome, Anne. Uh, thank you so much. Um, thanks, Caitlin, for the intro. Um, it's just so exciting to see so many people here for poetry. Um, so thank you all for, for coming out. Um, I wanted also to thank Ann Wolf for inviting me to write the chapter on Dixon um, and my fellow presenters, um, wonderful poets um, from whom you will hear soon. Um, so I wanted to start by just talking a little bit about um, Dixon's poetry and my sort of process of um, writing the chapter and researching it. Um, so, Dixon uh, published his poems, uh, after, the, or the book of poems that he published, was published uh, like 30 years after he died. Um, so, wasn't really well known during his lifetime. To my knowledge, there is simply one essay about it, one work of criticism, which is actually the introduction. So, for me, um, this was kind of an exciting and strange process because here were these poems that nobody really knew about and nothing had been written about them. So, the field was wide open for me. Um, and because, as Caitlin said, I'm really interested in the visual arts in relation to poetry and literature, um, this seemed like an especially good fit. Um, so I'm going to go pretty quickly through um, some of the things that I discovered um, reading and thought about reading um, Dixon's poems. Um, and then we can talk about it more in the Q&A, but I think the main reason that you're here is to hear from today's poets. Um, so what we'll do is I will talk about this briefly. Um, we'll have a little reading of Gilmarie and Sean's poems. I will add one poem at the end. Um, I'll have a couple of questions for our panelists, and then we will open things up for questions from you. Um, <clears throat> so, uh-oh, did I break it already? Wait, hold on, oh, there it is, okay. Um, so I wanted to start by just kind of introducing some terms, um, which are familiar terms, but which um, I think it's, it's worth defining. Um, so first of all, uh, landscape. We think about landscape painting a lot. Landscape also refers to uh, the natural world, often as it has been impacted by the human, right? So landscapes have been changed by human uh, hands. But landscape is also used popularly as a kind of general, non specific term. So when we talk about the political landscape, we're talking about landscape in a more metaphorical way. Um, and I wanted to mention the idea, uh, we think of the wilderness, especially here in Nevada, as something that is untrammeled and untouched. Um, but I wanted to refer to William Cronin's important argument that the notion of wilderness is itself a construct. And the notion that the West was empty when white people 
came out and started taking over is a fiction. So this is a construct um, that it's, it's important to remember. And the idea that Europeans were destined to conquer the West is um, a construct itself, right? Um, so also, when we talk about poetry, we often talk about nature poetry rather than landscape poetry. So thinking about poetry in terms of landscape is something kind of unusual. Um, so just a little bit of background about Dixon's poetry. Um, this is the book of his collected poems, as I mentioned, um, published posthumously. Um, he did publish some poems, and I actually found some poems that were not in his collected poems that were published elsewhere. Um, so as I say, it was kind of like a wide open field. Um, and um, just that critical introduction is the only thing that had been written until I took my hand at it. Um, so one thing that I think the exhibit upstairs does a great job of doing is kind of looking, uh, depicting the different um, aspects of Dixon's work. Um, so, oops, okay, wait. <laughs> So, do you want to avoid this one? Okay. There. Um, so, for my purposes, the opposition between images like those, the one on the left, which is uh, something he did as an illustrator, commercial, representational, kind of familiar in its subject and approach, on the one hand, and some of the works that are much more abstract and as the exhibit says, modernist, on the other hand, um, seems really striking to me. And one of the things I wanted to do in looking at his poetry is think about how it related to his paintings for which he is best known. Um, so in, in line with that, um, I identified two strains of early 20th century poetry, um, both of which I think are evident in Dixon's poetry. On the one hand is Western or cowboy poetry, which tends to be written in uh, a, a traditional form, often the ballad form with rhyme and meter. Um, it uh, often laments the urbanization of the West and uh, emphasizes, it's very nostalgic, emphasizes the, uh, the, the kind of pure past and the evils of civilization. Um, and has a kind of traditionalist, nostalgic feel to it. Modernist poetry, which was being written around the same time, is quite different, or seems quite different. Um, this was poetry that for the most part used free verse, no rhyme, no meter. Um, it used, at least at times, very concrete, specific images and um, was informed by World War I, among other alienating events, and therefore um, ideas of fragmentation, uh, the impossibility of wholeness, the destruction of received ideas about religion, society, the future. Um, so, one of the things that I discovered, and this was kind of exciting, is that the image on the left here is uh, a book that was illustrated by Dixon that I just found online. So, these poems that he illustrated are really traditional cowboy western poems. Um, so, I, I there had some proof that he knew about cowboy poetry and was perhaps influenced by it. And indeed, he was influenced by it, I argue. So the poem on the right uh, is a poem that is in ballad form. Um, it's formally similar to cowboy poetry, even though thematically it's somewhat different. The poem on the left, uh, the excerpt which I will read, um, really emphasizes that sense of nostalgia. The old ways pass, the prairie is plowed, the forest is felled, and the city is burnt, and of the strong free men who moved the solid hills, building their roads to the ocean, none now remain. Um, so we have different elements of the cowboy aesthetic there, not combined in a single poem, but they're there. 
Um, so then I started thinking about Dixon's relation to modernism. And again, there's a section in the exhibit upstairs that talks about modernist paintings influence on and, and Dixon's participation in that. Um, so here's a poem that uh, it's, uh, looks not, nothing like a cowboy poem. It's all over the page. It has long and short lines um, and um, spoke, focuses on a particular image in nature, the ancient tree with upreaching branches that the poem then explores and speaks to and addresses um, and tries to find a lesson from, still I feel your steadfast mast immovable beneath the stars. Um, so a poem that might even be associated with a kind of imagist aesthetic in some ways. But as I note on the right, um, it's not quite a modernist poem. It's not really about alienation. Um, it's, uh, it, it refers to and allegorizes nature. It personifies it in ways that are associated with a more traditional mode. Um, so I thought that maybe thinking about Dixon as a regionalist, almost kind of proto quasi modernist might be one way to kind of make sense of his work. Um, so modernist regionalism is evident in works like American Gothic by Grant Wood, Faulkner, Winesburg, Ohio. So these are works that were written or created during the modernist period, but have a strong sense of place. Um, so, um, Yes, and I think, uh, well, maybe I'll, I'll read the first part of this poem just to give you a sense of it. Um, and I think one thing that's important is that regionalism is often considered slight. It's of purely local, solely local interest. What long and painful days of dumb endurance have the patient hills, widely the wide parched winds of drought, pass and repass, sadly or flowing them, breathing the wordless prayer of desert lands. By what hidden urge the vague and evasive clouds gather tumultuous on distant horizons, rolled forward with what resistless profit force, fulfilling some blind destiny of far disintegrated suns. Um, so you can see that the poem begins with and, and refers to the desert landscape, but it also transforms it into a series of uh, uh, something that the, that the poet is interrogating, right? The wordless prayer, um, asking questions of it. Um, so this is a super brief uh, version of my chapter, um, which goes on at much more length. Um, but let me just go towards a provisional conclusion. Um, this is an image of City by Michael Heiser um, in, in Nevada. Uh, the land artist, um, that may be a combination of modernist, free verse, expansive form, and universalizing, moralizing language can be found in other regional Western poets. And I was especially interested in Robinson Jeffers, the California poet, about whom Dixon wrote a very negative poem, but in my analytic mode, I thought, well, he, maybe he actually was really influenced by him because he seems to say that he hates him. Um, <laughs> um, and then I also wonder whether this combination of kind of expansiveness and almost grandiosity as well as minimalism and paring things away might be an attribute of Western visual art from Heiser um, going back to George O'Keefe who was a, a contemporary of Dixon's. Um, and that's kind of a very quick version, um, but the exciting thing is we now get to talk about these and other issues um, with some real live Western poets. Um, so I'm gonna introduce them, um, and then they will come up and we'll all sit in a row. Sean Griffin and his wife, Deborah, founded the Community Chest in 1991, a nonprofit organization that directs more than 30 programs for Northern Nevada, including art and social justice projects. Griffin has taught a poetry workshop at Northern Nevada Correctional Center for over 30 years and published a journal of the men's work called Razor Wire. 
He's the author of numerous books of poetry and prose, including most recently, River Ask Me Why, Into the West on Two Wheels, which is a memoir, and No Charity in the Wilderness, a book of poems. In 2014, Griffin was inducted into the Nevada Writers Hall of Fame. Um, Gail Marie Palmeyer, now emeritus faculty, taught creative writing at the University of Nevada, Reno. Widely published, she's the, order, the author of three chapbooks and three full-length collections of poetry, the most recent of Bone, of Ash, of Ordinary Saints, published in 2020, which was nominated for the High Plains Book Award. In 2015, she was appointed Reno's first poet laureate. In 2016, she was inducted into the Nevada Writers Hall of Fame. <clears throat> and in 2017, she was selected as outstanding teacher in the humanities. In 2021, the governor of Nevada appointed her poet laureate of the state of Nevada. Uh, in 2022, she was selected as a laureate fellow of the Academy of American Poets. Um, so please help me welcome our poets. still working the dance out. Good evening. Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Gail Marie. And thank you to the museum for hosting us. We've been talking about, you know, what Maynard Dixon's poetry means to us for several months. And uh, Anne was right. You know, I think he was, he was uh, deeply influenced by Jeffers, but supposedly in a negative way. And the other real uh, strong uh, influence to me now is uh, William Stafford. There's two poems of his that are very much like William Stafford's, At Last and Affirmation. There's a, there's a line where he, he's asking the stones to speak for him, and, and what Stafford says is what the river says. That's what I say. So this, you know, I think he had those, those, uh, those influences. The other thing I noticed upstairs, Frederick Remington said to him, draw nature, draw just nature. And that's very much like John McPhee. I write about places, people, and things. So after um, the, the first poem I'm going to read is um, <clears throat> the poem about Jeffers uh, that, I, that I wrote, because I love Jeffers. And I, didn't, uh, I don't believe that he really disliked Jeffers. <laughs> The, the, line, the three lines I want to read from um, <clears throat> Maynard Dixon are these. His poem is entitled Jeffers. What now? Should you let this old fellow Jeffers dismay you for all he has made these redolent Carmel Hills? And he goes on and, you know, kind of excoriates him. But I, I don't really believe him. I think it's one of those me thinks he doth protest too much things. Anyways, this is my first poem. And Gail Marie and I are going to read back and forth. So I'm going to sit down after this and she's going to start. As I said, I love Jeffers. Reading Jeffers in the rainy January dawn. Reading Jeffers in the rainy January dawn. What is to say that stone and bird and tree cannot? Because like Whitman before him, he was guest of the cliff, the gall, the leaf. And worse for us, he wrote through the durance of two wars with melancholy to guide from shorebird to stone, then died, a deer laid down to coast water. And without sanctuary, memorized the trinity of flora, fauna, and we, however inhuman, raked back to ourselves. Of course he lost faith. We strove to divide the, worlds from the, man, the words from the man on the seacoast, who stood like Machado, the ancients, the mother's keening under the weight of anguish and light, a man apart from the abacus of time and state that gilded now could not destroy. Impatient, humbled, sonorous poet, he chose the stones, the birds, and the trees to venerate beauty and truth, the delirious constant in the new world, no man without them. Now I'm going to turn it over to Gail Marie. <clears throat> I hit our thing. 
Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I turned off the show. <laughs> you know, um, as the Dixon exhibit is called Sagebrush and Solitude, I've been thinking a lot about solitude. That which is chosen and that which is imposed. Um, my work is truly narrative and character driven. Um, I'm interested in smallness. Um, those people who move through our landscape, often unseen and unheard. I'm totally fine with a big old dollop of sentiment, as long as there's a dose of irony. Um, so uh, during the course of our round robin here, I'm gonna read three poems. And if I had to suggest a theme for these, I think I'd suggest the nearly mythic and controversial idea of going west to discover something, whatever that something might be. One of my favorite lines in Dixon's poetry comes from a poem called Searching, and the line is about lingering in the purple, damp shadow of sadness. So this poem I'm gonna read is set in Cathedral Gorge State Park. It's called Man, Dog, Daughter, Jesus. He sits outside his ancient RV, wearied after his fourth trip to the woodpile. At $4 an armload, this detail suggests he's planning on more than a night or two. He's built his first fire in the March chill, brought out the fraying lawn chair, the one with stars patterned in red, white, blue, not quite an American flag, but close. He's got an equally old border collie, at least in dog years, and at dusk, the onions chopped, the burgers grilled, the blessed scent of baked potato easy in the crisp air, he feeds his dog by hand. Let's call the man John. Let's call the dog Lucky. John's rig has Arkansas plates, so I wander over and tell him I came from the land of opportunity, the state's old and retired motto. We recollect and tell stories about what makes Arkansas so very pretty, but nothing like this celestial Nevada landscape. Its haunt, its openness, how the space both reveals and conceals. I'm here by choice. John's here to find his daughter gone now nearly 40 years. He hasn't much time left and even Lucky is old and declining. Jo John could be my own father if mine had come down from the hills, had taken me into Eureka Springs to show me the imposing statue, Christ of the Ozarks. A reverent afternoon, lunch in a little bistro, hush puppies the size of tennis balls. It's there in the soft booth, a place of cloth napkins and heavy flatware that I decide to leave. The tourists are laughing and drinking. They're here to see the seven-story Jesus, third tallest in the world, two million pounds of steel and mortar. Their voices are filled with light, confidence, amusement. They find humor in big Jesus. And that's what I want, a life that allows for irony, a life lived in places from which one tours, finds quiet America a diversion, a place best seen briefly. Perhaps I make my way to Las Vegas, an act of impulsive courage, or maybe I go to Reno, city of compromise. But this isn't my story. This is about John and about Lucky, about their search for a middle-aged woman one remembers as a good girl the other has never known. John's driven through Tulsa and Albuquerque, as far north as Omaha, places she once said out loud, tomorrow, Sin City. He hopes she's not there. He hopes she's looking for him, finds him sitting in his festive chair. He'd set off some fireworks, sparklers she used to love. He prays for that day. Lucky just puts his chin against paw, and from somewhere deep within his small but surely sacred heart comes a keening known well.
So Gail Marie, Gail Marie and I were going to riff off of the, the three words in that poem, and I'm going to do so with this one. One of, one of Maynard Dixon's poems is uh, World's End, um, <clears throat> and he talks about those three words. I am a city's wan, unwilling guest with three good friends, a dog, a horse, and a gun. And this is uh, my poem with three words in it as well, different words. One of them's the same. This from the new book. After the election in the desert south of Hawthorne. Almost to the iridescent bloom of the wildcat ranch, a red Chevy out front like a rose in the dust, and farther still the snow on Boundary Peak cuts the horizon from Earth. Would you lie with her? I ask myself, with no answer but the sullen pose of monogamy. November, post-election, in these few hours of karma light, and what of us in this fresco of burnt color, of the woman in the trailer, hidden like an outpost of affection? The cold hands of morning reach to still the darkness. On the road edge, the last moisture frozen before dawn, staring into the mouth of tomorrow, each mountain, a light of sage, devil's breath, and salt brush. Crossing into Esmeralda County, I leave her in the mirror. The frost remains. But as Patchen said, is it enough? A crow answers at Red Lick Summit, and I descend into nothingness, somehow reminded of the brown country below. I will name it for her, burnished daughter of paradise. Today, a senator said all we need is a gun, a horse, and a plane to ride whose legs have been parted now. It's almost make-believe until I understand the desert is a place where rocks cry and a woman bleeds in the palm of what was left behind. There was a lot of discussion among us about trying to talk about the other West, which is not the pretty West, and that's why I'm reading this poem. That was an outstanding poem, by the way, Sean. Fabulous. And I loved, 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 loved it, and I love it. I love serious poetry, but sometimes I miss a little humor in contemporary poetry. And I'm not talking about guffaw, knee-slapping humor, but what I'm going to call tender humor. The way we observe others in their moments of little discoveries, when they're discovering something we might take for granted, for example, and how what can seem silly can also be cherished in its mundane magic. And this poem is called All Manner of Corn. In the elegant lobby of La Posada in dusty Winslow, a basket of blue corn grown in the hotel garden draws Lena. She's here with her husband, Frank, finally driving Route 66, finally having her first night in a four-star bed, clawfoot tub, the promise of exotic dishes in the turquoise room, peaky bread, and stuffed squash blossoms. She's eager to see if the blossoms resemble her necklace, the prettiest thing Frank has ever bought, did yesterday at a roadside stand the heavy silver so very Arizona. <laughs> Lena watches the trains pass, wants to sit in the wicker chairs after dinner, imagine arriving here by rail. But it's the blue corn that amazes. And when she turns to Frank, says, this is beautiful beyond belief. Frank, have you ever seen such a thing? Frank says he has. He knows all manner of corn. He studied corn the one year he had college, Omaha, 1969. You hear all of this, see Lena's bright face and Frank's earnest brow. Imagine what it might be like to know all manner of corn, to know all manner of anything. 
if you could only be assured of expertise in something hard, in something of sustenance, in something like the tiny blue kernels of the heirloom corn. The corn you'll always think of as Lena and Frank partners driving into the final rows of their future. You wish them well, deft certainty for Frank and sweet astonishment for Lena. You wish them both an abundant crop of days, like this one, full of exquisite corniness. <laughs> So I should never try to keep up with Gail Marie. <clears throat> Clearly I can't dress like her. The desert is sanctuary for me, uh, much as um, that's the title of uh, one of Maynard Dixon's poems. And I'm going to read the other side of it. I think that poem for him is the vision of his desert. And these are just a few lines from that poem, Sanctuary. Lonely, lonely and vast, this is the ultimate peak and outlook. Here begins the long release and the silence. Here the trail ends. That's Maynard's poem. This is from a chapbook, and it's uh, for Katie Donovan, a dear friend um, who lives in Winnemucca. I was driving to Winnemucca when I wrote this. Rain outside, Lovelock, late March. The first whiskers poke from greasewood. Clouds sulk the ridge beyond an alfalfa farm. A roadside cross pretends to grieve, and the few willows reach to rye patch, a last body of water before the dry, endless miles. This could be the road to Inuvik, and there is no warrior at the horizon. The landscape, landscape is quarantined. A desert peach offers pink rosaries to the slopes bladed for minerals, once white and hard with tranquility, now dust in the atmosphere. This is what the desert surrenders to the magpie bloated on the center line, to fresh prints at the petroglyph, to the feral galaxy of spring. <clears throat> So lovely. Um, you know, uh, I too was drawn to, and, and much like many of the lines and images in Dixon's poetry, um, particularly how the word dust appears often, and most poignantly in that last epitaph poem that Sean mentioned earlier, titled At Last, where Dixon writes, I shall give myself to the desert again, that I, in its golden dust, may be blown from a golden peak broadcast over the sunlands. I'm also drawn to these lines from his poem called Departure, where he writes that we all come to an age when we are only loved for what we have been. I'm gonna finish my round here with a poem called Address What Matters, and I think this poem nods a little bit at least, <laughs> toward those lines of Dixon's, that dust and love and having been matter. You know you want Marilyn's dress, not the one your mother wanted, not the rhinestone second skin she sang his song in. Happy birthday, Mr. President. Not that dress. You want the simpler but also sleekly tight little thing she wore here in this Nevada town. The dress she wore while drinking shots at this bar in Dayton. Cocktail cherries, halter back. You want this dress because she wore it here, but also because everyone who watched her learned of her secret special talent how she could wield a paddle ball a hundred times and never miss a strike. Her hips, egg yolks sliding around a big bowl kept time. And so did the men who loved her or wanted to. No one 
Not even Miller nor Houston knew she could do this, could create this moment of pure, carnal joy. The movie is The Misfits, and you watch it every year because you think it matters. Think Marilyn Matters, this bar where you and your third husband spend long summer hours. Think it all matters. Everyone has a story here, and some remember Marilyn, or say they do. If you had her dress, you could be fearless, could show everyone who's ever doubted that you have skill. You can shudder air. You would move through the ferocious heat like the dry desert dust, which is where, when you're done here, you're headed no matter what. Thank you, Gail Marie. <clears throat> so one of the other things I was struck by in Dixon's poetry was his minimalist approach. Um, we've talked about kind of the romantic and the sentimental piece and the way he sort of dips into that too much, but um, some of the time he's really good at just stating stuff simply. This, this is one of his poems, Camp in the Rockies. These are just a few lines. Cold September moonlight in the mountain the silent, pale, gleaming tent below the dark, steep-edged peaks. <clears throat> My response to that poem is, is a similar experience. Uh, we were camping in Great Basin National Park at 10,000 feet. I was with my two boys when they were still boys. Emerald Lake. Campfire, cook stove, cold mountain. Not far from Han Shan, my boys and I on a glacial cirque, the youngest twitching the ugly stick, the sacred golden trout inches below the surface. On what green splinters do we lay our lives? Pine bough, alpen lake, stumpy moon. Overhead, a falcon sweeps sky, and last night, the haunting wings in our camp. Was he wounded or hiding? I reason with the, works, with the marks of work and men most of the year, but today, smoke-filled and arguably the happiest I've been, relinquish my stern hold on things and clutter the lake with my bones, the three of us, cold, naked stones. <clears throat> Thank you so much. I want to introduce Ann Kennison, who's going to read a poem, and I think we're going to do questions with all of you. Um, so we were talking before about how long we've been in Nevada, and I've only been here for 21 years. Um, so I feel like I'm sort of a newcomer. Um, so one way that I have found to write about the Western landscape is to do it through the works of other artists. Um, and I've been working on a series of poems about Western land art. Um, so this is a poem about Spiral Jetty um, in Salt, outside of Salt Lake City, um, which you guys maybe are familiar with, yes? Um, so this is a poem um, in which I am plunking a bunch of citations, descriptions of Spiral Jetty. Um, and um, so you, you might hear those. I'll try to read them a little differently. Um, and uh, they're sometimes very clunkety <laughs> terms. A giant fishing hook suspended in Great Salt Lake is what Robert Smithson tried first, then remade in homage to inanimate crystalline structures or a whirlpool, or nearby petroglyphs, his construction a memorial to local indigenous people displaced or killed nearby, or an emblem of the empty western vista inscribed with human meaning, a set of contradictions the spiral represents. Or 
He just liked that shape, and I'm overthinking this, especially since entropy is how change mostly appears. The stone construction submerged for a decade, but since 2002 exposed a useless berm, raised driveway, widget on a stalk. Its changes in appearance documented in annual photos taken by the foundation tasked with looking after it Though they can't intervene, even if the thing unravels or collapses or gets vandalized by the curious who arrive in gas-guzzling SUVs, the rutted washboard road requires. Pilgrims or weirdos, I'm not sure which. In any case, I've decided not to make the trip, which might be why this is my favorite work of land art, though apparently it underwhelms up close. Self-defeating, says one critic, purposeless, an anti-ecological emblem of catastrophe. The antithesis of Stacy Levy's homage critique, a spiral of floating mats of recyclable synthetic material that extract excess polluting nutrients from the tainted water. By now, the elements once hidden under Great Salt Lake are blowing into town in plumes, a toxic cloud abetted by farmers who still grow thirsty crops. Spiral jetty, these days, not a metaphor or thing of beauty or elegance, but a harbinger, a bellwether left high and dry. Thanks. So maybe I can start off our Q&A um, by asking a, a question or two of my own. Um, one thing that strikes me and perhaps strikes all of you is how different your guys' poems are. And I wonder um, if you could talk a little bit about the extent to which you see yourself as a Western poet, the idea of landscape, if that's a term that you think about and use. Um, and how you sort of situate yourself in terms of Nevada in particular and the West in general. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or anything else you want to say. Well, I think I'm a Western poet by length of residence at this point. <laughs> Um, 40 years, so the majority, majority of my life. Um, but I do remember um, this wonderful, I met this woman and we became really, really dear friends, but we were at a party, I was new to um, Nevada, and I don't know what I was wearing at that point, but uh, she said, uh, you know, no self-respecting Western ranch woman would wear those boots. <laughs> and my response was, darling, I get my style from Nashville. Uh, so I, I, you know, I'm not sure that I would really identify always as a Westerner Nevadan, but identify as a Nevadan, as a citizen of Nevada. Um, I also have another, I thought, funny story. I had an editor call me once who had seen some poems and uh, it was for an anthology of poetry from the rural west and he asked if he could have the poems and of course, I have no shame, I said take them. They were set in Arkansas. And so this was, you know, so I think that I, I'm not, I guess I more identify as um, someone who writes a an internal or social landscape, and a lot of that has to do with uh, rural pers uh, persona. Yeah, we talked a lot about the internal landscape because I think I visit that a lot as well. I think I'm very much a, a, a Western person, uh, and the environment inhabits almost everything I write and think about. Uh, I do see myself also as a Nevadan, just like Gail Marie. I've been here most of my life since I got out of grad school. Um, I can't live in this place without thinking of its light um, and its darkness, uh, its aridity. It's always so dry. My boys and I did a long ride last five years ago, and 
most of the West has water. <laughs> we don't know what water is in this state, and it, and it defines us. Its absence really defines us. Um, I, 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 I would have trouble, actually, trying to write if I wasn't from here. I, le I grew up in the city. I grew up in L.A. And, you know, when I just came back from L.A. because my son lives there, the words that, that were in my head were leaving the monoscape. That's what I feel when I leave the city. It's a monoscape. It's not what we live in. And they don't have any, any uh, lack of love for us either. It's okay. <laughs> we get along. <laughs> I was from there, so I can say that. I, th I think I, I just, uh, one thing I might add to that is I cannot either imagine, but I too came not too far uh, uh, after graduate school. Hmm. So I'd only been out of graduate school maybe a couple of years. And uh, so I think I became who I am today mm. because I lived in Nevada mm. and chose to stay mm. in Nevada. Mm. I also noticed, and we've talked about this, Anne and, I, and Sean, that my work changed dramatically over a period of maybe a decade. Mm. Um, because when I was living in a densely green and an extremely humid climate, I was really a formalist. And I'm thinking, was it because I just needed to be contained because everything was madness and you know, <laughs> oppressive? Um, and I noticed that my lines over the years have become longer and looser. And so I have to go back and talk about an imposition and impose formal elements sometimes, because I'm like, oh, I'm all over the page here. <laughs> but I, I love that. That's an openness that allows me to do that, I think. Mm. Yeah, that's great. Um, one more question um, for you guys. Well, yes. And then I hope you guys have questions, too. Um, so uh, I, I didn't say it in exactly that word, but I think Sean did, and it's maybe evident that there's some dangers or risks of being a poet like Dixon. Um, sentimentalism, um, kind of a, maybe an overreaching for the grand or grandiose. Um, there are also some kind of very unfortunate stereotypes in some of his poems. Um, and Gilmer, you, you referred to irony, both in your mm -hmm. intro and in mm -hmm. one of the poems. But mm -hmm. could you guys talk a little bit about what kinds of dangers you see in writing about Nevada, say, and how you try to circumvent them or avoid them or maybe embrace them? Um, OK, um, I'll try. <laughs> um, I One thing I. I consciously do, and it took me um, a long time to do this, because I think um, coming up initially as a formalist, I was um, self-consciously poetic. And so one thing I really strive to do is to um, not use poetic diction. Try to write a conversational line, one that um, uh, it is more akin to plain talk, which of course it is obviously not, but I, that's sort of the, the craft that goes into trying to make it sound like plain talk. Um, sentiment, again, I, I, I struggle with that because I write character-based poetry. Um, and I think what I'm willing to do is get perilously close to falling off the cliff <laughs> and then falling back. So I try to push that button a little bit. All right, how, how close to being, you know, I, I think a poem, for me at least as a reader, has to hit me in the heart first before it goes to my head so, because I won't go back and reread it if it's not layered and if I wasn't emotionally moved by it first. But it is really hard, I think, um, to, uh, you know, not fall into it occasionally, at least, even. So when I was working on the book about Carruth, I couldn't get the lines from his long poem, paragraph 25, out of my head. Roundhead, Ivy League, cavalier, smartass, never who I was, say it plain. 
And I think every poet struggles with that. And that's what Gail Marie was just saying. You, you work hard, finally. You scrape a long time to get what you have to say on the page. And I think writing about the hard stuff in Nevada is, is <clears throat> it, it has to be spoken. Um, you know, part of the reason I wrote the poem about the cat house is we act like it doesn't exist in this state. You know, it sort of doesn't appear somehow. I don't know why. Well, I know why, but. And I write a lot of poems about what we've done to this place. This, we've left this place a little damaged. And I hope, you know, our kids and their kids can turn that corner. It's not just the lack of water. Um, we, we have, you know, we, I started painting and doing sculpture 30 years ago because I was protesting the DOE test site and they wouldn't listen to what I wrote. So I started taking paintings and sculpture to the hearings. We have, to, we have to change the way we're living to change the state. And that's what we try to do with our poetry, what I try to do. But you're not gonna make it, you know, poetry, of course, doesn't do much in that world, but we can. Um, and I would just add that I think for me, writing the land art poems, it's a way for me to kind of engage with some of the ugly, parts of, yeah. so the gas guzzling and the, and the farmers and the, and the kind of arrogance of the land art, those land artists from the 60s who are sort of imposing their mark on nature. So I, I think that for me is also a way to like sort of work in some critique even as I'm focusing on these artworks. Um, but let's, let's open it up to you guys. Um, so, <coughs> I think there's a mic coming around, um, so maybe raise your hand and um, then we can hear from you. Questions about, for the poets, questions about Dixon. Hi, I'm Nikki. I'm here from Quincy, California with a group of students. Um, so I'm curious, because we have a lot of young creative writers here, how, so I was in Nevada, I was in California for 17 years, then Nevada for 20 years, and I recently relocated to California. Um, and I felt like a Californian the whole time I was here, and now I feel like a Nevadan now that I'm back in California. <laughs> so this idea of identity and place, and what you said about internal and social landscapes, I was just curious if you could speak to more the idea of how we, I, I don't know, I guess like compromise or change or form our identities based on these kind of ideas of what we are and what we aren't in relation to place. Because I'm struggling with that a little bit as a Californian now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, um, hi Nikki. <laughs> Good to see you again. Um, you know, I, I don't know if this is going to answer your question. I'm going to try to find the back door in here. Um, you know, you're talking about re regionalists. Being called a regionalist can be sort of a bad thing or be a put down. I don't have any problem being called a regionalist, right? Um, I, I kind of embrace it in some ways. Um, but I, you know, when I was uh, in grad school, we had an anthology that we carried around. I mean, it was like one of our Bibles. It was edited by Ed Field. It was called A Geography of Poets. And it was organized by region. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, there would be the West and the, you know, and actually it was much more sophisticated than that. Um, you know, the Rocky Mountains, um, the, you know, the Delta, the this, that, all around. And I loved that because not only were the poets represented in their uh, various regions doing regional work, but it was also showing the diversity of the voices in a particular region. I also took a seminar in grad school um, and we studied the what was then considered the various schools, regional schools of poetry. And this will crack you up, but there were like six, according to my prof. Um, <laughs> New York, San Francisco, um, the West, um, uh, the, the South, now that was a big deal, um, and Iowa was its own thing, okay? So 
Iowa was its own thing. And uh, it was really, it was kind of, you know, the other students are on the seminar table. I mean, we did a lot of elbowing, he, 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 and giggling and all of that. But it was also fascinating to see someone suggest that there was a certain type of poetry that came from a particular region. So um, I, I, don't, I know, Nikki, that that's really not answering your question. But I think that um, if we embrace the community in which we live by contributing to it in some significant way, then um, we are already kind of acknowledging and embracing the place in which we write. I would add that just maybe that idea of landscape as being a capacious term, mm -hmm. not just being about writing about like the trees and the water and the rocks or whatever, mm -hmm. but thinking about both, I mean, I'm quite taken with this idea that landscape is touched by human hands. And of course, all the landscapes in the US have been touched by human hands and altered by human hands. But also, I think Gail Marie's poems are such wonderful examples of the kind of human landscape um, and, and the, the way that character studies can also offer a glimpse into if they're real or if they're imagined, if they're really overheard or not, it doesn't really matter. Um, but that that's a way to engage with place um, and perhaps both positively and negatively. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the people from this place give give you so much to to appreciate and 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 think about. You know, when I'm writing, they're always in my head, always. And I think that that's a regional landscape that comes into you, wherever you are, whether it's New York or or here. You're you're assuming and, and assimilating that environment that's all around you all the time. You can't you can't not do that. You know. When we're abroad, I'm physically in that place, and I'm literally in that place in my mind, in, in my work. I absorb it. And I think that the, long, the, the real challenge here is remaining vulnerable, staying open, staying open to the risk of putting yourself out there when there's so much openness, and taking it in and trying to share it in a meaningful way. Everyone's experiencing this. We have to name it. That's our job. Tamara, I think you had a question. Well, my question was oh, really I think we, do we need the mic? Or? Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. My question was really oh, Hold on. I think they're recording, so we need to. Um, I don't have such a wonderful, <laughs> profound question to ask. I was interested uh, in Gail Marie's book about Break a Heart Road, because you mentioned mm -hmm. Dayton, mm -hmm. and I've been lived in the Dayton area off and on for 40 mm -hmm. years. and. I'm very curious about the backstory for your Break a Heart Road poems. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I, I'll do. The, I'll give you the skinny okay. backstory. <laughs> the skinny backstory is that um, I I wrote a grant um, and I was going to write a series of baseball poems um, told from the point of view of people associated with a minor league team. So think Silver Sox back in the day. Mm -hmm. Okay. And my, um, they're called, and this is a bad word in some ways, but they're baseball annies. They're called baseball annies. Those are who are groupies. And I called her Emma um, instead of annies. To, I thought it was cool. I don't know. But I called her Emma. And I wrote three of those. And they are in Break a Heart. Well, I wrote more than those. But three of those, I think, still are in Break a Heart. And then I realized that and again, being someone who's interested in character work, Emma would not leave me alone. <laughs> and it was sort of like, I was demeaning this character by making her no more than a fixture who hung out to go out with minor league baseball players after the game. <laughs> um, and so the whole idea of Break a Heart Road, it was like, who travels that? So most of those poems are from, well, they really are all female voices, but primarily it's Emma's voice that runs throughout it. And the, the book was originally called What Emma Loves, and Gary Short and I were driving uh, 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 50, and 
I looked out the window and saw the sign for Break a Heart Road, and I said, I wonder what a house on Break a Heart Road would look like, and he said, there's your title. <laughs> and so that's it. That's, that's the skinny version <laughs> of that. Thank you for asking. Hey, where, can we go over a few minutes? Is that okay? Okay. Yeah, this is just a quick comment. I think that the poetry is great. Uh, and uh, this is something from uh, the late, great Kobe Bryant said, embrace the hate. If you're good, you know, they don't hate you. They only hate people that are great. I think that has something to do with this place thing because you guys embrace the place so well. Mm -hmm. Just embrace the place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have one question. Okay. okay. <clears throat> um, hi. Um, I just had a very quick question about, I heard the sentence about writing through the work of others. And so um, I love poetry. I wouldn't say I'm a, I'm a poet yet. I'm a blossoming poet. Okay. Um, but I often mimic, like I like to look at other people's work and then basically write through them as well. But the problem I have with that is I sometimes feel like it's, it feels inauthentic to me. And then people will compliment my poetry and I'll be like, well, thanks. It's not me, but thank you. Um, so my question is, is there a way to do that in a way that it will feel authentic to yourself, even though you're writing through the work of others. I, I can maybe speak to that. I'm, I'm a big fan of imitation. Um, and I, I will just say that I spent uh, one afternoon like reading intensively this poetry book. Um, and then I sat down and wrote a poem, and I thought, oh my god, it's such a carbon copy of what I was reading. But you know what? It wasn't. It actually wasn't because it was filtered through me. So I, I think, I mean, doing imitations as exercises, I think, can be a great way to open things out for a, a, an emerging poet. But um, I, I, I almost think, like, read a bunch of poems by somebody and then put the book away and take out your whatever it is you write on, and, and trust that you know, you'll, you'll take what you need and you will come through, mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Uh, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. If you could all help me in thinking and Sean and Gail Marie. We'd be happy to hang out up here if, if people have questions they didn't get to ask or were too shy to ask. Just come on up if you'd like. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.